Hi, this is Swapnil Bharti and we are here at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in Shanghai, China. And today we have with us Shang Lang from Rancher Labs. That's right. Uh, it's nice to see you. Very nice to see you too. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure because I've been chasing you for a while, mm -hmm. so it's good to be uh, sitting down with you and talking again. Likewise. Uh, yeah, and you delivered a, a talk with Goldwind, which I think one of the largest manufacturers of wind turbines in, the, in China. That's right, they're the largest in China, mm -hmm. third largest in the world. Excellent. That also means that they have totally, because when I think about wind turbine, I just think about, you know, machines, you know, I don't think about IT infrastructure, but I am aware that they may have a lot of sensors there, how they, you know, detect everything and they, so can you talk about what kind of, you know, IT infrastructure they have because you work very closely with them? Yeah, it, it, it turned out uh, one of the biggest problems they actually needed to solve was to uh, uh, gather all the sensor data they have uh, with all the wind turbines and then use that to uh, forecast the, the status of the system and also especially uh, the situation with the weather, with the wind speed, because that has a very big impact on the power output, which impacts the grid stability. So uh, it, it's a, because, you know, because of the large amount of uh, uh, power these, uh, these power stations actually generate, it's a, it's, it's a very difficult problem. And it's a distributed and edge computing problem uh, by nature, because even though uh, the power companies, uh, the headquarters are largely centralized, but they, they actually function in many different states and provinces. And then inside each province, they actually have many different plants and a, a plant would have, so they basically have this third, three level uh, IT structure. They have a central location where they're, where, you know, the, the headquarters of one of the power utility is. And then that utility would serve a number of provinces or states in China. And then uh, each of these states essentially would have uh, a second level data center. That, that, that does a lot of data processing. And then finally, at each power plant, which could be built in fairly remote locations, uh, there will be uh, some edge computing nodes. And each edge computing nodes would manage dozens of, uh, uh, you know, a few to dozens, maybe up to a hundred uh, uh, wind turbines. In what capacity are they using, you know, uh, can you tell us about the open source technologies? Yeah, uh, you know, they, they built a, uh, they, they, they developed this whole technology uh, pretty much in-house, uh, built using uh, open source technologies uh, from the ground up. Uh, they, uh, I mean, they use, they use a lot of uh, uh, storage technologies, uh, you know, they use uh, object storage technologies, they use um, um, they use sort of analytical big data storage technologies like, like Hadoop-like technologies. And then they use uh, uh, AI technologies that they, they use to try to uh, learn about the, the, the weather patterns and predict uh, uh, the speed of the wind and direction of the wind. So uh, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, sophisticated system. Uh, so the, 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 the challenge they have uh, really was uh, how to distribute this software stack to a number of locations, you know, both their uh, central location and uh, the, the regional, the, the, the state and province level data centers, and especially all the way out to the edge locations. And there's actually a lot of commonality. They have a, they have a common sort of AI big data platform. They actually distribute everywhere. Uh, and it's microservice based. It's it's built uh, out of uh, uh, you know pretty much the same set of uh, open source components that the, the uh, you know big data and storage and AI that I talked about. And then um, uh, and they, that's that's why they use Kubernetes. So they have a unique challenge of actually running uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. We investigated uh, potentially using one big Kubernetes cluster because these are. Uh, locations are connected, but the bandwidth is not that high. And, uh, and that bandwidth has to be primarily used to, uh, to actually uh, take in the sensor data itself. So, so they, there's really not that much uh, extra bandwidth available to run, uh, you know, run hundreds or thousands of kubelets across 
uh, across half of China or half of a major big country, and they sell worldwide, right? And uh, and 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 then collect the data. So 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 I think in one particular deployment they talked about in the talk, there are actually over six hundred Kubernetes clusters. Mm -hmm. Most of them exists uh, uh, existing these edge locations, and they have to have a way to distribute. Uh, and, and deploy these Kubernetes clusters, and then they have to have a way to manage these Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, so, so with, uh, with Rancher basically provided two pieces of technology. That was all part of Rancher product that, uh, that solved their problem. One is we have a Kubernetes uh, distro, a Kubernetes installer. I mean, it's, it's, in principle, it's not, like, not unlike many other uh, uh, Kubernetes installers, but I think it's 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 we we built it uh, to be particularly easy to use and particularly uh, efficient. So it's called Rancher Kubernetes Engine, and 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 they find it very useful. So so they use Rancher Kubernetes Engine to distribute to basically build these Kubernetes clusters, both in the central or regional data center as well as on the edge. Then. Um, the other aspect of Rancher that they find it useful was uh, multi-cluster management. Uh, so Rancher provides a unified management plane across uh, really any Kubernetes cluster in theory. I mean, you can, you know, other Rancher customers actually use Rancher to manage GKE clusters or Huawei CCE clusters, as well as clusters they built themselves. But in this particular case, they just use Rancher to manage their, their the Kubernetes clusters they built with RKE, and uh, and 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 then they can they can pretty much write a script once, and 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 through Rancher it can kind of get all of their software updated. Then we're, we'd be like monitoring the health of these clusters and also the applications running on top of these clusters. We'd be upgrading uh, the clusters as well as the applications running on top of these clusters. Um, and, and so this is a, a you know this this is basically the the the, the 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 challenge that they have that Rancher solved. So as you help uh, Goldwind, what are the biggest challenge that you saw they were facing? Yeah, they talked about it in uh, yesterday as well. It's it's really quite fascinating. Uh, uh, so 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 they were you know technical challenges and and sort of not so technical challenges. A lot of the technical challenge was uh, around the, uh, um, uh, uh, the resource consumption of Kubernetes itself. So it turned out there, uh, we're actually not able to uh, you know, completely use Kubernetes across all their edge nodes. Some of their edge nodes are fairly sizable, so Kubernetes is okay, but some of the smaller ones, they only have eight gigabyte of memory. And if, once you deploy even a single node Kubernetes there, it takes up half of the resource. So, so you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a little too uh, uh, heavy weight. And we're, we're uh, motivated by this and by a bunch of other customers with, with similar requirements. We, we, at Rancher, we've actually embarked on an effort to dramatically, try to dramatically slim down the, the weight of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is really, uh, you know, nicely modularized code. So you can, you can really move, remove a lot of stuff you don't need without really impacting the rest. So, so I think this problem could be solved. You know, I, we really want to push the envelope of how small Kubernetes can go. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of developers run Kubernetes like Minikube on a laptop. It doesn't seem to take that much memory. But the reality is, once you put on real workload, right, it, 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 it actually increases uh, uh, the memory footprint quite a bit, even, even in, a, in a Minikube situation. So, 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 so we're, we're going through a round of optimization. And I'm fairly optimistic, you know, working with the community, we can, we can make progress uh, uh, in, 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 this, in this direction. The, uh, the, uh, and and the, 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 the challenge is because we don't really want to, like in this case, we don't really want to just run Kubelet. If we could get away with just running Kubelet on the edge, it would have taken a lot less uh, a memory footprint. But the problem is uh, then uh, uh, the whole system is just not as isolated, not as reliable. And because, uh, like I said earlier, the networking is kind of really their bottleneck and it's not entirely reliable because it's built on 
you know, it's, 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 it, it goes through telcos and stuff. So, uh, so, so they really wanted an independent Kubernetes cluster at the edge. Um, uh, so this is sort of the, I would say, the, one of the major technical challenges that they're still working through and we're working with them. Uh, uh, then there, 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 there are more sort of organizational challenges. Um, uh, the, the, it comes from two directions. One direction is, is their internal operations team are actually struggling with Kubernetes quite a bit, even, even today, especially some of the, they say, some of the more experienced um, uh, 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 you know, uh, IT operations personnel just really struggle to learn some of these concepts because a lot of these guys have more, they are not really DevOps engineers by traditional definition. They're, they're more like just, just, just IT admins and, and you know, they're, they're, they're more comfortable with virtual machines or physical machines or networking and, and this is just all new. It's a little overwhelming. And, and another thing is I think, uh, another thing is I think this uh, whole technology is, uh, is not quite completely built up. So, so some of the complexities of the infrastructure in Kubernetes is actually exposed to, uh, to some of the AI uh, data scientists and, and, and they don't quite like some of the uh, worries now they have to uh, pay to, toward the infrastructure. So, so we, we basically need to do more work to really abstract some of the Kubernetes complexity away so, so data scientists and AI engineers would feel more comfortable with it. So yeah, I mean, you, you rightly said, you know, these are some of the smartest people and they will be solving this problem and they'll keep making Kubernetes better and better. So thank you, you know, once again for talking to me today. And as usual, I look forward to meeting you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.